to those of you who are alumni. Um, it is sponsored by the Law Alumni Association. If you haven't been involved with the Alumni Association, I encourage you to get involved. You are all members of the Alumni Association. We have a board of directors, and um, all of us would like to hear from you what, how, what we can do to help you, in addition to providing free CLEs, which we'll continue to do on an at least annual basis. Um, housekeeping, um, you should have all gotten an email either yesterday or this morning, and if not, please check your spam filter with the link to the materials for today's CLE. Um, we do have uh, a limited amount of extra copies of, of printed materials um, at, the, at the desk outside. There was also in that email a link to a survey. Um, we're asking if you could please complete that. It's a very short survey. It's going to help um, the law school as we try to advocate for increased access to justice and use of limited scope representation in the courtroom. Um, let me briefly introduce our two panelists and then we'll get started. I want to note that this is being recorded today. Um, credit will not be available to those of you um, who aren't here, but um, if, you, uh, if you ask a question, I'll ask the panelists to repeat the question so the recording will capture it. Uh, first, we're going to have Bob Weisberger, who is, um, who is counsel at Scott and Handwerger, where he focuses on estate planning, guardianships, and litigation. He's a Rhode Island native, um, previously worked for many years at Edward and, Edwards and Angel, now Lock Board. Uh, Linda Lang is our next panelist. She's the secretary of the Rhode Island Bar Association and a member of Strauss Factor Lang and Lyons. She devotes her practice primarily to litigation, commercial law, and creditors' rights. And I should have asked Linda, are you a Rhode Island native? No. I didn't think so because she didn't have the accent. Um, so thank you to, to both of them for um, coming today. Um, and I'm sorry that um, our third panelist had to, um, had to decline uh, participating today because of her new judicial responsibilities. Um, Melissa Darrigan, now Judge Darrigan, was supposed to be on the panel with us, but as you know, this was rescheduled due to snow. Um, I'm glad all of you could make it. Um, Bob's going to speak first, and then Linda. During Bob's portion of the presentation, um, please hold your questions until the end. He has allotted some time for questions. Um, during Linda's portion of the presentation, which is more in the nuts and bolts, you can feel free to ask questions during. So thanks for coming. Thank you, Amy. Good afternoon. Hello. What accent? <laughs> what does the phrase unbundled legal services mean? Does anyone know? How about the phrase limited scope representation? Program you're here for. You all know what that means, right? I can tell you, with my, about six years ago, my first brush with it, I had no idea what those things meant. But I have a little bit of an idea now. And, uh, you know, first, Take a self-represented litigant who needs assistance of counsel but isn't able to afford the cost of the full representation. However, he or she is able to afford some limited assistance of counsel on a more a la carte basis. So, you know, such as drafting legal pleadings. And voila, you have LSR. Now, we have a lot of material to cover, and um, I've been told to forget this story, but I'm going to tell it to you anyway, because I would like to start off this way. There's a story my dad used to, to tell, and uh, it has to do with Winston Churchill. Well, Linda, she's already heard this. Point, and uh, he was invited to speak at the Ladies' Temperance League, and which was kind of strange, because Winston Churchill had quite a reputation for drinking liquor. And so the president of the Ladies' Temperance League came up to him and said, Oh, Sir Winston, I think it's odd indeed that we've invited you to speak before the Ladies' Temperance League. After all, if we were to fill this room with all of the brandy that you've imbibed, it would fill a place to there. And she pointed to the wall just a little bit below the ceiling. And Churchill looked at where she was pointing and looked to the ceiling and said, Oh, madam, 
so much to do in so little time. <laughs> so now that I've burned up a couple of minutes with that, on to me. <laughs> you know, in state courts, most people proceed pro se most of the time. The high volume state courts, including traffic court, housing, small claims like in the district court, they're really dominated by self-represented litigants. Now in the last 25 years, domestic relations courts in many jurisdictions have shifted from litigants being mostly represented by lawyers who were self-represented litigants, and that, that was really you know, the most common situation. And anecdotal evidence suggests an increase in self-representation in personal civil litigation matters. I've read anywhere from 61 to 94 percent, or at least one side is, is self-represented. Now, although the courts and the bar are attempting to provide substantial assistance to self-represented litigants, the scope of this assistance is limited. Many self-represented litigants now have widely available resources of private document preparation uh, services uh, you know, both online and over the counter. And despite challenges based on allegations of unauthorized practice of law, these services such as legal zoom have prevailed in the courts. Despite all of these changing landscapes, many, if not most, self-represented litigants need more than just procedural assistance offered by these resources. They need to know more than which forms to use, how to docket their cases, and what time to appear in court. They need assistance with decision making and judgment. They need to know their options, the different possible outcomes, and the strategies to pursue their objectives. In some cases, Self-represented litigants need advocates for some portion of the matter. The services can only come from lawyers. So beyond mere advice, self-represented litigants also need direction on completing forms, not just to make them legally compliant, but to make them strategically advantageous. They need more than mere mechanical documents with mechanical preparation. They need documents filled out and filed with both foresight and with judgment. And to optimize the self-represented litigants outcomes, they require a lawyer to advocate their interests before the tribunal, at least for a limited purpose. Now, this added input from lawyers not only assists the litigants, but the court as well. <clears throat> as the better prepared litigant, the more efficiently the court operates. Now, in most venues involving pro se litigants, a court's choice is not between a fully represented litigant, as is much preferred, but the hope of a pro se litigant who is well prepared as opposed to one who is not. Now, courts can avoid in a procedural, uh, courts can avoid litigants in a procedural revolving door when those litigants have access to services that lawyers provide. If we look at Rule 1.2 of our Rules of Professional Conduct, Rule 1.2c, now 1.2d, states in pertinent part, a lawyer may limit the scope of the representation if the, if the limitation is reasonable under the circumstances and the client gives informed consent. The client must give knowing and informed consent as part of the written limited scope representation engagement or retainer agreement. Court administrators and non-legal uh, lawyer legal service providers in the marketplace, such as document uh, uh, preparation services, provide general legal information. But that's not based on the specific individual facts, as only lawyers are capable of providing clients with legal advice about specific matters. Thus, a question is raised about whether a lawyer can provide a client with only legal information, such as that provided by a document preparation service, uh, you know, without any further inquiry. Now, you know, we know that there's transactional legal work that occurs all the time, 
a lawyer may get a call and say, um, I'd like to send you a contract, I'd like you to look at it, and you tell me what you think. Well, that type of limited scope representation happens all the time in transactional practice of law, but not so much in the litigation area. So if, for instance, this contract was going to be the subject of litigation or negotiations, probably more than just a, a phone call would be required. But whether or not uh, a lawyer can provide a client with only legal information is a thorny issue on this new frontier for the bank and the bar and, lay the, and the lay public alike due to, to the professional duty to adhere to the ethical rules of conduct. Now, as our Rhode Island Supreme Court really astutely addressed in its order amending Article 5 of the Rules of Professional Conduct, and specifically Rule 1.1, a lawyer must provide competent representation to a client. Accordingly, the Rhode Island Supreme Court augmented Rule 1.1, addressing competent representation in a limited scope representation situation to read as follows, quote, a lawyer and client may agree pursuant to Rule 1.2 to limit the scope of the representation with respect to a matter. In such circumstances, Competence means the knowledge, skill, thoroughness, and preparation reasonably necessary for the limited scope representation, close quote. Thus, even though competence means the knowledge, skill, thoroughness, and preparation reasonably necessary for such limited scope representation, it does not mean that the lawyer's scope of duty is limited to, uh, to the duty to the client is limited in the limited scope representation context. In other words, the lawyer must consult with the client about the degree of thoroughness and the level of preparation required, as well as the estimated costs involved under the circumstances. So while the rule affords um, the lawyer and the client substantial latitude to limit the representation, the limitation must be reasonable under the circumstances. Therefore, using the ABA's comment to model Rule 1.2c to illustrate, if, for example, a client's objective is limited to securing general information about the law the client needs in order to handle a common and typically uncomplicated legal problem, the lawyer and client may agree that the lawyer's services will be limited to a brief telephone consultation. Such a limitation, however, would not be reasonable if the time allotted was not sufficient to yield advice upon which the client could rely. The comment ends by saying, although an agreement for a limited representation does not exempt a lawyer from the duty to provide competent representation, the limitation is a factor to be considered when determining the legal knowledge, skill, thoroughness, and preparation reasonably necessary for that representation. So I submit to you that it, it has to be thought of in this way, that the representation isn't what is limited, it is the scope that is limited. Therefore, if the limitation of the scope of the representation prevents or limits thoroughness in the advice or advocacy that's provided, that's necessary to handle the client's legal problem, then the limited scope representation probably is not reasonable under the circumstances. Now, since close to six years ago, when this started with me, uh, I've only had the opportunity to do one limited scope representation matter. And uh, I was really very glad that I set it up this way. When the Supreme Court, um, you know, we already had limited scope representation in the sense under Rule 1.2 uh, back, you know, before the cases that went up on appeal that we'll talk about in a moment. Um, it, we had no guidance, no rules, no procedures, no, no rules of practice. And um, so the problem was, uh, you know, you really could get yourself into a situation where you were in a matter and you couldn't withdraw. So um, when the Supreme Court came out with, with an amended rule and more guidance, uh, they, they, uh, they put in some guidelines that you know, were, very, were very helpful in this regard. However, they made them applicable. I think the rules 
make uh, limited scope representation applicable to superior court, district court, family court, workers' compensation court, the traffic tribunal, those sorts of things. But I'm not so sure in probate court. And as luck would have it, the matter that came up with me was a probate court matter. And this was a, a fellow who lived in California and had a, uh, uh, a wrongful death case for his daughter. She was hit by a ripped up bus in Rhode Island, badly injured and later died. And uh, his estranged wife in Rhode Island had proceeded with a wrongful death action. And um, the matter was pending in the probate court in Coventry because uh, that, was the, that was the appropriate court for that time. An administration had to be taken out for the decedent's mother in order to pursue the wrongful death action. Well, this fellow called and he said, you know, I really need representation. I'm in California, I'm 3,000 miles away. I need someone to go to the probate court. I need to know what's been done so far. And I have a sense that the case is soon going to be reaching some sort of a settlement. And, uh, you know, I, I don't want to, you know, be left out of the mix in this. And uh, he and his wife had been divorced for many years and, and were estranged. So I was happy to help him but I did not want to get so involved with him in the case that I wouldn't be able to extricate myself, although it wasn't in lit it, it was in litigation, but that involved other part parties. But I didn't know where this was going to lead. So I said, well, I'll enter into a limited scope representation with you. I'll charge you X amount per hour. I'll put this all in writing. These will be my specific duties and responsibilities. This is what I will do. This is, these are what your duties and responsibilities will be and we'll proceed accordingly. And then I will represent you soon thereafter. What happened was there was going to be a, a settlement for a substantial amount of money and then the allocation of how the damages would be applied, how much to the, the wife's consortium claim, the husband or the father, I should say, didn't have a consortium claim because he wasn't involved in the beginning of the litigation. And so the allocation was going to put most of the money under the consortium claim to the ex-wife and almost nothing to pay in suffering where as the two heirs of law they would have shared 50-50. So I said, well, I'll go into the court and I'll represent you on this and without all of the details about what happened with the litigation uh, at, at that stage, um, they said he is not entitled, the other side said, he is not entitled to recover anything uh, because he was supposed to make child support payments ordered by the family court, and he never did. So consequently, he's in contempt of court, and then under, therefore under the section of the wrongful death statute that deals with this, he should not be allowed to recover anything. Well, the problem with that is no contempt proceedings had ever been brought, and they were about to be brought in the family court, and I don't go to family court. I mean, I could, in 35 years of practice, I could count on one hand the number of times I've been there. And so I was really not, uh, equipped to go in and, and represent him in that. So fortunately, I was able to uh, set him up with another attorney who was able to take that part of the litigation, handle that, and then, you know, and I took over from there with an additional agreement, which Linda will tell you about under the limited scope. But if I had generally agreed to represent him, it would have been uh, a very difficult situation if I had not been able to find someone else to take over this part because I really wasn't, didn't feel that I was competent to do that aspect. So it worked very well because, as Linda will tell you, there is a limited entry of appearance under limited scope representation. And what happens in limited scope in, in litigation uh, is that you are always concerned to enter your appearance in a case where you're going to have to file a motion and get court approval to withdraw. And if you're trying to do limited scope, you want to be able to automatically withdraw once you have fulfilled those responsibilities that you've agreed to fulfill under your agreement with the client. So under limited scope and the rules that have been promulgated by the Supreme Court, when you file this limited uh, appearance, once you've signed a certification and filed it that you have fulfilled those duties, you are allowed to automatically withdraw, which is, you know, very, very helpful. Um, and I won't go any further on that aspect of it because Linda is going to be covering that. I know, um, but let me give you a little bit of background 
about the Rhode Island Bar Association's involvement in the issue of LSR. So it was about more than five years ago, uh, November 22nd, 2013, and the Rhode Island Supreme Court was invited, uh, I'm sorry, the Rhode Island Supreme Court invited the Rhode Island Bar Association to submit an amicus brief regarding whether ghostwriting is permitted under Rule 1.2 of the Rules of Professional Conduct. And uh, they also wanted to know about the propriety of the imposition of sanctions pursuant to Rule 11 relative to three cases that were up on appeal. Now the three cases each involved attorneys who authored pleadings on behalf of pro se defendants in three separate debt collection cases. These attorneys did not disclose their identities on behalf of the pro se defendants. Now all three attorneys were separately sanctioned by the Superior Court and all three attorneys took timely appeals to the Supreme Court. The issue of whether the anonymous preparation of pleadings for self-represented litigants was a, uh, or the issue uh, of, of whether the anonymous preparation of pleadings for self-represented litigants was a permissible practice pursuant to the Supreme Court rules of professional conduct was, the court wrote, one of first impression in Rhode Island. Now at least one year prior to the invitation to submit the amicus brief, the Bar Association had already begun a task force to examine to examine the subject of limited scope representation. Now, I, at that time, I was chair of the task force when it began, and the subject of unbundling of legal services and limited scope representation was one on which the ABA had already done substantial work, including the issuance of a formal opinion in May of 2007. And also, virtually every jurisdiction in the United States, every state in the United States had limited scope representation, including all of the New England states except Little Rhodey. So uh, we had already adopted uh, rules for in these other jurisdictions. Many of them had in implemented or adopted rules for the implementation of limited scope representation with procedural mechanics, such as limited entries and appearance that I was just talking about, so that attorneys could provide unbundled legal services that is handling less than the entire litigation. So limited entries of appearance with the ability to withdraw, withdraw the appearance without a motion and court approval of withdrawal were in our key procedural mechanics for limited scope representation in litigated matters. Without these procedural dispensations, limited involvement became impossible as an entry of appearance would potentially marry an attorney to the litig litigation too long to risk involvement, which is how these three attorneys with pleadings that they filed anonymously got into trouble for ghostwriting in the Superior Court, and that was the issue that went up to the Supreme Court because they didn't want to sign those pleadings because if they did, the signing of a pleading and the filing of it in the Superior Court or the District Court or whatever court for that matter in Rhode Island is an automatic entry of your appearance. Now you can't get out of the case unless you file a motion before the justice and ask to be allowed to withdraw. So when the invitation came to serve as amicus curiae came, um, the, the task force uh, had already begun. Linda and I were on that, and, uh, um, and at that time, I was president of the Rhode Island Bar Association, and we, we had been working with the task force toward putting together some sort of a comprehensive report to submit to the Rhode Island uh, Supreme Court to give them uh, you know, our ideas and our input on you know, how we should expand Rule 1.2. So we spent, leading up to the time of the, the invitation to file the amicus brief, a lot of hours reading what was going on in the other states. We were researching, we were discussing the subject, and we were meeting with chief judges of all of the Rhode Island courts um, and the traffic tribunal, as well as with representatives from Massachusetts, because they already had a pilot program for LSR in Mass. And uh, we had a judge, uh, we had a clerk uh, from Massachusetts, we had practitioners from Mass who addressed us, addressed the task force, and gave us information about how they developed their program, how it was working, so on and so forth. And um, they had been working in close connection with the SJC in Massachusetts, who, as I said, had started a pilot program, started there, I think, in their, what they call their land court, and then expanded into the probate and family court in Mass. So 
Anyway, within that time frame, the initial task force uh, had been able to examine the ethical, philosophical, and practical aspects of limited scope representation, but had not yet been able, within that time frame, to write our report for submission to the bar. Uh, and that was, would have been to our governing bar, body, the House of Delegates, and uh, let alone put together a, a compendium to make our recommendations to the Rhode Island Supreme Court. So consequently, uh, when the amicus request arrived, the task force decided, after consultation with the executive committee of the Bar Association, to call a special meeting of the House of Delegates to authorize submission of an amicus brief on the subject of limited scope representation. And that, uh, that we, we decided would substitute uh, as supplying a report to the Supreme Court. We could contain all of our findings and our recommendations in the amicus brief. So the HOD, or House of Delegates authorization, was forthcoming, but it was after much debate. And uh, although it was recognized by the Bar Association that Rhode Island already permitted limited scope representation at that time pursuant to Rule 1.2C, um, which reads, as I said before, a lawyer may limit the scope of the representation if the limitation is reasonable under the circumstances and the client gives informed consent. Uh, it was understood and agreed that Rule 1.2C provided insufficient guidance or rules of practice to guide Rhode Island attorneys. Moreover, it did not provide any of the mechanics for LSR. Thus, the task force recommended that forms methods and procedures be developed for submission to the Supreme Court as part of our brief. And it was further adopted that the bar recommend that LSR practice be allowed in litigation in all civil cases in all courts of Rhode Island where it's reasonable under the circumstances and where the client gives informed consent. The bar also agreed that forms be, be recommended excuse me, for use in limited entry of appearance with automatic withdrawal of appearance on written notice without court approval. It was further agreed that the bar would take the position that ghostwriting is permissible provided the attorney drafting the complaint or other pleading identifies themselves on the document with notice that the document was prepared by them. Because there were three schools of thought on how that would work. The ABA position was the most liberal, that you could draft a pleading and that and give it, and the pro se could sign their name to it, but you didn't have to disclose your name or that it was done with assistance of counsel. A second, which was more of a middle tier, would be just that, you know, it was provided, it was prepared, excuse me, with the assistance of counsel. And then the third and the most conservative would be the preparer, the lawyer preparer of the pleading, whether it be a complaint, an answer, or any responsive pleading uh, or motion. Uh, that they would identify themselves, uh, but it would not act as an entry, uh, entry of appearance in the matter. And that was ultimately what the Supreme Court in Rhode Island adopted. And that was the part that the, the Bar Association through the House of Delegates had advocated. So, um, in essence, our, our brief, I think, covered everything from A to Z with, uh, best of all, an extensive appendix that uh, showed how our sister states had implemented rules of practice and procedure as well as model forms for consideration and possible utilization. So when the Rhode Island Supreme Court filed its decision in the appeals, uh, those three cases, in June of 2015, it invited the Rhode Island Bar and other interested persons to submit written comments on limited scope representation. It reversed the Superior Court decisions vacating the sanctions under Rule 11 and created provisional rules for lawyer drafting of pleadings without entry of appearance. Now, at this juncture, the Bar Association created a new committee on LSR, which was then chaired by my colleague, Linda Lang, who did a fabulous job and, and really worked tirelessly to put together a complete you know, recommendation in writing for the, for the Supreme Court and submitted that. So that hard work was rewarded when on May 23, 2017, the Rhode Island Supreme Court entered an order provisionally amend amending Rule 5 of the Rules of Professional Conduct 
as well as setting forth model forms for implementation in the Superior, Family, District, and Workers' Compensation Courts and Traffic Tribunal, with direction that the Chief Judicial Officers of those courts report results to the Supreme Court in one year. So I believe it's fair to say that the Rhode Island Supreme Court implemented all of the critical recommendations that were made by Linda's task force and uh, with you know only some moderate and, and reasonable modifications. So that is an overview. I know that was a lot to kind of throw at you in, in about 25, 30 minutes, but um, that's the overview. Now, the real interesting stuff is in the nuts and bolts. And for that, I'd like to turn the podium over to my colleague, Linda Lang, who will uh, give you uh, some stuff that'll be uh, absolutely scintillating, I assure you. Hi, everyone. My name's Linda Lang. Um, how I'd like to proceed at this point in time is if you have any questions whatsoever as we go along, feel free to ask questions. Um, go ahead. I just wanted to ask um, Robert if that one-year report, because it's been more than a year now, if there, because I haven't seen any. There hasn't been. There's so the been courts no... aren't, aren't actually complying with that. It, it, yeah. It's my understanding that how they're tracking the um, this particular issue is by um, the electronic system. So when you e-file a limited scope um, type of um, entry of appearance, that then triggers the calculation of how many people are actually using it. And there hasn't been enough um, drop downs in the electronic system for there to be a report, as I understand it. And that's one of the things that has been my biggest disappointment is, is I really think we have a great opportunity to grow our practices, to serve people which need attorneys, and we're still not using the rules. And you know, every time I get together with a group of people, it's because they have concerns and they worry about whether or not the court system is really going to let them out of the case. And um, you know, and and your question kind of gets me a little bit off track, but it's a very near and dear type question to me because um, if we don't start using it, all of our, um, you know, these individuals which have very limited means to hire us will continue to use the pro se method and um, be kind of lost, get upset about the legal system, get frustrated with the results that they're getting in the system and that doesn't help our um, goodwill in the community and so we need to find a way to start using limited scope. And I was going to end with this, but I'll start with this. One of the things that was recently done by the Bar Association on February 27th, I don't know if you saw the email blast from our president, Carolyn Barone, but there's now a limited scope referral network. You can go in and actually sign up through um, lawyers, lawyer referral service, and you can ask, actually um, go in and state that you want to participate in the limited scope opportunities that are um, with the Bar Association. So we're trying to market this so that young attorneys can go ahead and um, start expanding their practice. Um, it also allows um, the pro se's to um, receive um, legal assistance. And the Bar Association, just like every other organization that tries to help um, those individuals, receive a lot of telephone phone calls from the public. And um, you know they might be in family court law. I know Carolyn has talked to the chief judge in that particular area because they have such a huge volume of um, pro se's in the court system that they see this as an opportunity to perhaps give those individuals some help in the areas that they may need it. Um, certainly near and dear to myself, it's collections. Um, you you know every day I'm in the district court and I um, see individuals which are. Um, struggling, trying to figure out how to represent themselves. I had one today, and the woman came up to me, and she said, I, I don't believe I ever received the initial pleadings. I showed her the pleadings. She still didn't remember um, receiving the summons, but I can't tell her what to do as opposing counsel, but she really needed you know, some li limited scope, and the opportunities to send her in a direction is very limited, um, but she, you know, I think she was on, um, um, TDI and not working so she had 
no funds to pay for an attorney, but she could certainly um, use someone's help to do a proper motion to vacate. The judge tried to assist her somewhat from the bench, but she didn't talk about the need for that motion to vacate to have an affidavit. So I can almost guarantee that this individual is going to write a two or three sentence saying she wants the judgment vacated uh, because that's the word that the judge said, but she doesn't understand the rule. And that's where she might um, have a need through limited scope for someone sat down and said to her, you've got to put it into an affidavit what it is that you're trying to do, why it is that this should be um, undone. So, um, but that's a, one of the places that I think um, is, would be very effective. Um, the landlord tenant is another area that they're seeking. Um, we all know that there's tons and tons of um, situations with um, evictions. But one of the interesting things that I've learned in my research is that foreclosures is another area um, that has um, um, a need. And Yale did a law review article in May of last year, 2018, and they studied homeowners in the court system who were trying to prevent um, foreclosures, and they found that 50% of the homeowners which had limited scope representation achieved a better result than those which did not. So it's important to, to um, you know, think outside the scope of um, just landlord-tenant, but also include some um, foreclosure work. And then as Bob said, contracts, that's a very popular area that, you know, just maybe have a second look at a lease before you enter into a lease so that a person understands what they're um, signing before they sign and then end up having to um, litigate over it. I think Bob partly um, addressed this um, fairly well with the um, what is limited scope um, and some of the examples we've already talked about. Um, one of the areas that we haven't talked about is also in the special needs advocacy. Um, certainly in um, special needs situations, children have a, a need along with their parents. And, um, and, and at least from my reading of other cases, that's an area that um, could also use um, limited scope. Um, what is limited scope not? Well, it's certainly not limited liability. One of the biggest concerns that um, attorneys have in this particular area when we were talking about it is the malpractice. Does it affect my malpractice rates? So on the committee that I chaired, we had actually the insurance um, um, committee's chairperson in, and she asked um, Aon, which is the um, um, most of our insurers for the bar association in the bar, um, whether or not they um, would insure something like with this, with limited scope. And they assured us that they actually um, do it all the time in Massachusetts, um, and that they um, usually um, um, have forms that they can actually give to people to assist them. And I think one of the th places that we learned is Massachusetts has a wealth of um, training materials. So if you can get your hands on it, it's very accessible on the internet. You just um, can go in and it will provide you with all sorts of um, um, packet of materials. I think it's about 60 to 90 pages of uh, materials. It even gives you um, mock interviews so that you can get a feel as to what types of questions you should use in an interview with a client in order to determine whether or not the case should be used for um, limited scope, but it's a wealth of information which I would recommend to you. Um, it's not unethical, that is one of the other concerns that people have. Certainly our rule authorizes us to do limited scope. Um, however, we also have to be careful that not every single case is conducive to unlimited um, scope representation. And, um, and it's not just for poor people, it's for people with limited means who might not be able to handle um, a, an attorney from start to finish at a, um, a, a, an expensive um, hourly rate. So that's how come limited scope exists, and um, that's one of the reasons why I think it's important that we um, try to, um, to implement limited scope. Um, one of the things that the, um, um, we found as a committee is that um, we all know that there's a lot of pro se litigants in our court system currently, and there's certain effects that happen because we have more pro se litigants in the system. 
The court believes that there's an increased amount of time which they have to deal with pro se, so it takes court proceedings longer because they have to uh, um, filter some of the information that they receive from pro se's because some of it may not be relevant. Um, pro se litigants don't understand the process and they become frustrated with the court. And then there's also just the economic um, pressures of dealing with pro se's. And every judge has got a different method on how they deal with pro se's, as we all know from being in the court system. Um, and one of the questions I'd just like to ask this group is, um, do you feel that courts spend more time dealing with pro se litigants? Do you believe that they have a different standard than what us attorneys may have? Um, and that all seems to be um, um, the opinions of the bar, too. Um, did you have a comment? Can you just clarify whether LSR only applies to civil? Is it authorized in the criminal context? I don't believe the um, rules dealt with that that were given to us by the Supreme Court. Our committee decided not to include the criminal pro process because of the fact that there's due process problems that would arise once you started representing, you know, representing an individual, it's kind of very difficult once the due process has um, started to, to get out of a case. So we decided that we weren't going to um, um, recommend that it be used in the criminal sense, but I don't believe that portion of our report um, was adopted by the Supreme Court. Yes. You've referenced, um, you've both referenced forms up until now, and I, I, I don't, I'm not aware of any forms or where you would locate those, and also you've mentioned, you know, e-filing. Um, so how would that, how's that mechanism, how does that work in terms of if I, if I filed something as, you know, limited scope, um, is there some way that it, it clicks or something that I'm, I'm not doing it in that, in my other capacity, but in a, a different capacity, or how, how does that okay. actually work? Okay, um, we're talking about e-filing at this point in time. The only form that I know of that um, has a technical drop-down box is going to be the entry and the withdrawal. And I'm going to give you a very easy example because one of the attorneys in my um, one of my cases um, was representing a pro se individual, and he filed an answer. So what he did was is he filed a limited scope entry of appearance, and then what he did was he filed the answer which was prepared by him and um, he filed through the court system. And then what he did was, because it was, you know, I don't get to see their agreement. Um, what then they did was is they immediately filed a withdrawal of the appearance and then the pro se was on their own after that. So it was very, very simple because you use the regular forms that you would normally use if you were going to do an answer. But what would need to be done in that particular case is there would need to be a um, agreement that was between the parties. And I believe when the rules were introduced by the court, there were attachments as exhibits that were uh, forms which you could use. So there was a sample entry there were sample um, agreements where you could modify, and there were um, the withdrawal was also there. So there were some forms that the court actually put out with the rules back in June of 2017. That, that's correct. If you go to the order, uh, to her, but if you go to the order of the Rhode Island Supreme Court, uh, where they they promulgated what their decision was on all of this. In, in Exhibit B to that, they have model fee agreement, they have the entry of appearance, they have the limited entry of appearance, the limited, and the uh, withdrawal and, and other documents that you can utilize and just create them from, from that. Yes. At the end of the Rules of Professional Conduct, there are three appendices. One of them is for the forms for scope, limited scope. So, and, and they're very definitive. So there's limited scope representation engagement agreement. Language is pretty much dictated. Um, nature of the limited scope. I mean, it's very, very detailed. 
I think I was confused because you said forms, and in my head I'm thinking court files, you know, court form, drop down box, and that's what I was thinking, and not necessarily that it was part of the order or anything to do with the case. So I think that I might be, have been, I'm sorry, that and was And I, I just also want to, I, I personally believe because of each limited scope case is going to be unique, um, I personally believe some of the forms may need modification because of the fact that every case is going to be somewhat different and what the scope of what you're being hired for may be different. So it's very difficult to um, say for certain a form is going to be the end all that you're using. So you're going to have to think a little bit about what it is. Um, I also like, and I'm going to just throw this out there, is that I have my client come in and they decide that they want to hire me just to do um, a citation hearing, okay? Or maybe it's going to be to file an answer. What I believe would be the best course of business is, is I would have a checklist of all the steps leading up to that answer. I would have to review the um, complaint. I would have to make certain that I have a discussion about the facts with the client. And I would put down every single little task that I would have to do in order to prepare an answer on that case. I might also take a step further that if I'm concerned because they only want me to file an answer, maybe there's some counterclaims out there. Maybe there's a Fair Debt Collection Practices Act counterclaim out there. I don't particularly want to do that. Um, and so I might decline to do that because maybe it's beyond the statute of limitations. I don't know, but those are the things that you would also put on that list because you want to say, these are the things I'm going to do for you and check off those things so that they know clearly and precisely exactly what tasks you're going to do. And you're going to also have a list that you're not going to do. I'm not filing a counterclaim under the fair debt. I'm not going to, um, um, appear in court on the motion to dismiss. Um, so I'm going to have a list of things that I'm not going to do, and then I may also have a list of what they are going to do. You know, especially in the e-filing arena, who's going to e-file this document? Is it going to be me? Is it going to be the pro se? Um, you've got to have a discussion about that because um, anyone can go ahead and um, enter their appearance in a case in fact, our rules require that even though I'm as an attorney and added on that entry, the pro se also has to enter at the same time. So in the example we gave you with the collection answer, that pro se also filed an a entry because there had to be the attorney entry and the pro se entry at the same time when that answer was filed. So when there's a withdrawal, there's still the pro se who's entered. Do you have a question? Yeah. Let's say somebody files a limited scope motion. Uh, they agree in writing to do the writing or preparation, and then it gets scheduled for a hearing. Or what if you file like a motion for summary judgment, and the opposing party files their own motion, and then that gets scheduled for a hearing, and all you did was agree to file this written document? Where does where does that leave you? Well, that's where the agreement that you have with your client's going to control. Technically, if you drafted it well you should be able to withdraw after you file the motion if you're not going to argue that motion. Um, certainly, you could also go ahead and use a different method. Maybe it's ghostwriting. Because um, you, in, in ghostwriting, that's now authorized as long as you disclose that you're, you're actually signing off on that document. But it's not an entry of appearance. So you wouldn't actually enter you would just assist them with the document. But where I have my problems with your scenario is, is that you have what I think is going to be an affidavit attached to that document. And is that affidavit going to change at all? Because you could prepare it, and then the pro se might decide that they want to change that affidavit and you won't have any control unless you get that into your agreement as to who is going to control the affidavit. Because um, you know you don't want to be faced if you are going to enter an appearance on this with any type of Rule 11 sanctions because that still could be an, um, an opportunity. Did you have a question too? Yes, I'm pretty confused about this overlap between ghostwriting with no entry 
but an acknowledgement or a declaration of involvement with the drafting and a, open the door with a limited entry, drop in a document that you've written, and close the door with an automatic withdrawal, which seems to me, it feels safer to me as a drafter to open the file close than to be a ghostwriter who's, who's, then I imagine that I would place something below the certification of service that the pro se litigant would do with filing the, the document and serving it on the other party would say uh, prepared in consultation with my name and my bar number that's right um, so can you comment on this on the distinction between ghostwriting that does not constitute an entry and um, you know it kind of bleeds over from Jordan's question about well then who's going to argue the motion etc cetera, etc cetera, once it's drafted uh, and the practice of making a limited entry only for purposes of filing a document that you've drafted on behalf of the pro se litigant and then automatically withdrawing. I think I am more comfortable with the um, filing the entry and withdrawal. But in my practice, because I see so many answers with my collection cases, you'd be amazed at how many people prepare answers currently and do not even add the disclosures that are necessary for ghostwriting. I still have answers which look and smell exactly like an attorney answer, but the pro se signs it and uh, mails it to me because they don't use the um, system. I know those documents are um, prepared by counsel because most of the pro se's wouldn't understand the language in them. And when I file my summary judgments, the pro se's never come to court to make a dispute, which is really sad because I don't think they understand what it is that they were told was going to happen um, because they probably think their attorney's taking care of it. And um, you know, in, in, the, in my scenario that isn't happening, I have not, I think I've only seen one attorney which has disclosed that an answer was prepared by the defendant, by, you know, on behalf of the defendant and he took care of the e-filing to get around this particular issue. He did the e-filing and then served it upon me. But that's the only one which I've actually seen that way. No, no, um, may I just say something to uh -huh. your point? To your point, you know, it, we don't have this in Rhode Island, at least not yet, and the feedback that we don't have yet is probably gonna become important. In Massachusetts, in order to represent someone in a limited scope manner, you have to actually be certified through the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts through a program that they have where you, you take a CLE course and you've completed that and you, you've been trained on the do's and the don'ts and what the rules are. We don't have that in Rhode Island, so you know people might get the word, well, you can do this, but they don't know the particulars uh, and, and so therefore violate what the rules are. The other concern that I have with your scenario where um, the opposition also files um, a pleading in opposition, the motion to dismiss or their own motion for summary judgment, is I believe there's actually comments in, this, in the rules which say that only one person can speak at a time. So that is, um, so it would become very confusing because if you had been hired to also argue the motion for summary judgment, you would then be speaking on the motion, but your client would then end up having to be <coughs> pro se on the opposition, and it would get extremely messy. So I do have a solution for that, and that is, is you expand, if you want to, your limited scope agreement, and the rules do cover this, that you can at any time decide that you're gonna take on more tasks. I've been told by other attorneys and other jurisdictions that one of the things that they like is they sometimes will get a difficult client who comes into their office and they say, this is a good case, but boy, this person just seems to be really difficult. I don't really know if I want this person as a client. Well, this is a great way to um, find out if this client and you are going to be able to um, get along in the, in the legal environment. So you enter your appearance at the beginning for a very limited um, scope, maybe just filing the complaint. But if everything is going well, then you prepare a new agreement where you agree that you're gonna also do some discovery. 
and maybe then you'd file another one which extends some um, things further and you'd agree to argue motions for them. But that it doesn't commit you to um, being with a difficult client for the entire relationship. You're only entering for one specific task at a time, so you're free to leave whenever you want. One thing though, like I said before, is that Rule 11 still applies and you have to make certain that whatever you do file has to be well grounded in fact and warranted by existing law or a good faith argument. Guess we got going on questions and I didn't realize even the time but I uh, want to make certain that I um, touch base on one more thing and that's what I was looking for is my um, notes on communication because I think I hit all the other points of what I was going to do but I'm going to use the example that I had with the collection case for a second and it's going to come up in every single limited scope case that you have you're not privy as the opposition to what the agreement is between the pro se and the attorney who is representing them on the limited scope. So you don't know exactly what it is that they're in the case for. Is it just to file the answer? Maybe it's to communicate um, regarding um, settlement. So in my scenario, if we wanted to try to work out a resolution to something, who do I call? Um, and the rules state that you probably should communicate with counsel first and find out what the scope is of their agreement so that you're not violating any type of um, ethical rules. So you would call the attorney and you would say, you know, you know, this is at the point that we've got a summary judgment pending. Can we talk about re resolving this? And you would call the attorney and they would say, you know, our agreement says that it's the um, pro se litigant who's um, going to control settlement, or maybe it will be the attorney. But one of them should have, at least in their initial agreement, who's going to be discussing settlement so that the attorney opposing counsel at least knows what exactly is involved and who they should communicate. Sometimes it's not real clear, and I'll be honest about that. <clears throat> And you may have to ask for direction if you get into that type of a situation as to communication. I have sometimes, and I don't know, you know, because I'll admit I'm not always in court as frequently as I used to be, but there are times that I will ask the judge, who do you want me to communicate with? The pro se, who has been served with the citation, or their attorney who was representing them six months ago on a different hearing? Um, and it gets very confusing, and sometimes the judge will say both. Um, at least with the electronic system, they will most of the time tell me that it's going to be, you know, whoever's in Tyler. If it's the attorney who's still in, they're going to still be um, 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 the party who I contact. One of the things that you do need to know about Tyler and the e-filing system is when you file a withdrawal, you also have to disconnect your service contact because otherwise you're going to continue to get pleadings in that case and maybe you want the pleadings I don't know but that's one thing if you don't want the pleadings you've got to make certain you also disconnect yourself as a service contact okay so I've got a few minutes still before five does anybody else have questions has anyone tried limited scope I one question in the back yeah so I'm confused whether have you actually heard any anecdotal um, like stories of people having issues withdrawing, like any snafu, any challenges, no. I have not heard of anyone having difficulty. I am assuming that once it's more popular, I suspect some pushback. Um, but the rule is pretty clear that you are supposed to be able to use it this way. Um, we were talking about this earlier. There is a comment which says it's um, somewhat discretionary with the judge. I think it's comment number 10. Um, so you do have to be nervous a little bit about it, but um, I think most judges will want, would rather have an attorney in the courtroom than a pro se. So I think they're going to um, be more willing to deal with this issue than have no attorney at all. Yes? I just wanted to add that as a comment. 
Once you enter in that limited appearance and everybody's really happy with it, even though the rule allows that, sometimes the judge is going to be very, very strong to put your arm and not going to swap it up. And, and that's what I, I, I've already can see some areas where that would, especially, you know, if you're in the family court, maybe, depending on where you're practicing. Yes? Can you just comment, or Robert, can you comment on how the limited scope rules were also intended to make pro bono legal service easier and more manageable? Um, I was actually hoping they would be more easy, but they're not. Um, I was um, hoping that we would have um, maybe, a, at least in the legal services area, maybe some um, relaxation of the rules. But I guess in this particular case, like if you were doing a foreclosure um, assistance through the Bar Association, you're still going to have to do an agreement. You're going to have to do a conflicts check and then come up with you know um, an agreement that you still have. What I was hoping for is that they might have waived some of the requirements with the conflicts, but that didn't happen. But it still allows you to carve out kind of a bite-sized task on behalf of somebody on a pro bono basis. Right, we're at, we're at you know, rule 6.5 for nonprofit and court and next limited legal services. Uh, you, you don't need entries of appearances so much in, in that regard, and you just, you, you can go in and do your limited scope representation under the aegis of Rule 6.5. But what you're talking about, I think, is when, when it's a private pro bono case and not through uh, one of these agencies. Mm -hmm. And in that situation, yeah, you, 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 you'd be uh, still constrained with the entry of appearance, albeit. Limited. But the limited scope rules would still apply. So you could limited say, I'm only going to assist with your divorce, or I'm only going to assist with this visitation motion or you're not you don't have to do the whole that, that's correct yes. you know so for instance someone has gone through the whole procedure for their divorce but they uh, they need to enter a final decree of divorce so the transcript needs to be ordered and it needs to be reduced to writing for submission to the court for signature and you could do a limited entry of the parents and say this is what I'm going to do uh, and and you'd follow the 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 agreement is set forth in the, in the order that was promulgated by the court. You do that, and then you go ahead, do what you do, and then you file your withdrawal of limited appearance. And the only time that the court, under the rule, under the direct rule, not the comment to the rule, can challenge that is if the allegation, you're trying to withdraw your appearance before you've completed everything you said you would do under the agreement. But as long as you've done everything you're supposed to do under the agreement, you should be able to file your withdrawal of appearance and be automatically allowed to get out unless the client comes in and says, well, wait a minute, judge, I dispute this because notice of that withdrawal goes to the client. They could come in and say, oh, no, she didn't. Or, no, he didn't. They, they didn't fulfill all the obligations. And then the court would have to do an in-camera review of it and decide whether or not you, you have done everything you said you would do. I don't know. If, I hope that helps a little. I, I mean, it's just no different. I, I guess my point is, it's no different whether you're pro bono or not, but it does make somebody who takes on a pro bono case doesn't have to envision sort of being in for a pound, in for a penny. It, it, it does. Yeah. It does. And, you know, that's like one of the reasons that I wish that this was explicitly uh, applicable to the probate courts because, like, in my case, I wanted to do, I've, I've done a lot of guardianships. And I'd like to do them on a pro bono basis through the volunteer lawyer program or through other volunteer programs. But I was always afraid that a lot of the judges wouldn't let you withdraw automatically because you know you have the annual accountings to it. And you don't want to, you know, I didn't want to be married to them for the annual accountings, but the courts don't want it left for the client to do the annual accountings because they won't know how to do them perhaps or you know, but they could come back and on a limited scope I could do it. But we, I just didn't want to be firm, married to the to the We've garden. had a firm doing exactly that and doing a withdrawal at the end and have not had any problems with the court. And the limited, um, the, um, the engagement letter says quite clearly, you will be responsible, you client will be responsible for those filings. 
that explains think, exactly what they have to do. Yeah, I think that uh, you know we have 39 cities and towns, right? Yeah. And so we got 39, I guess, probate courts approximately. <laughs> so you know maybe the great majority of them would allow that. You know, I know a couple of the judges probably wouldn't. And so, and that, that's where I was kind of geared towards that, you know, with that comment, because I, I actually called the judge in one of them who, who remained nameless, but I said, would you, uh, yeah. oh, no, no. <laughs> I will tell you that one place that you can always get in and out of in um, a court is the Federal Bankruptcy Court. They've been doing um, limited scope representation for years, and, and that's how come I knew when I, um, got involved in this that it would work because it works very well over there. You may agree to just file a Chapter 7 bankruptcy for an individual, but you exclude out all of the motions for relief or any non-dischargeability agreements. And that's something that has been happening in the bankruptcy court for years. So um, it, it can, you know, it, it with the right planning and the right attitude, I think we can actually make this work and I think we can serve the public um, immensely with unlimited scope. It's, it's, it's good for the judicial system. It's good for access to justice. It, it, it's good for pro se litigants that can only afford the Camry and not the Cadillac of legal representation. And it, it, it's good for lawyers, too, because if you can develop a practice in this area, you really do have the opportunity to make an income. And, and on many of these cases, maybe expand. It's a la carte. But you know, there might be more selections made for more work done. So it's kind of good for everybody. It, 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 in my opinion, and um, I know you know the ABA shares that point of view, and I think to to a great degree our Supreme Court does too. But it, it's such a an unknown. It's kind of like you know the frontier, the old west. I mean, they, they don't really know what to expect until you've done more than just dip your toe into the water and kind of got a feel for it. It takes a lot of experience, trial and error, and, and we're looking forward at the bar association to hearing more feedback from the chief judges of the various courts where this has been implemented. Um, let me um, cut us off here because I want to be respectful of Bob, Bob and Linda's time. I want to thank them both for offering this seminar. This was a great opportunity for us to learn about something new. Reminder again to please complete that survey. If you're a Roger Williams um, alum or a non-alum interested in pro bono, you can speak to Liza and Susie back there. Um, thank you again very much and let's give it a Thank you.